I'm here today with uh, Scott Graves from Two Sigma. Scott, welcome. Thank you, Seamus. Nice to meet you. And we're at the uh, Boston Data Festival and ODSC event. And um, just uh, you gave a very good talk here just uh, an hour or so ago, very well attended. And we've got some good feedback on that. But before we get into that, I need to ask you about your title. Mm -hmm. You've got a very cool title, Software Artist. How does one become a software artist? Well, thank you. Uh, you know, I became, I've been an artist pretty much my whole life. That's what got me into computers. That's what got me into programming. And so it was just uh, a way I had of entertaining myself, trying to make, a, trying to write a program that surprised me. And so that's, that's really turned into my whole career. Very good. And um, Two Sigma, hedge fund based on New York, correct? That's right. What is a artist doing at a hedge fund? Well, the processes of art making and of doing uh, research are actually very similar. You know, they're both cases uh, where you're messing around and you don't really know what you're looking for until you found it. And you want an environment uh, that gives you total freedom. And so, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a computer guy and uh, you, can, you can do, I make my art with computers and I do, you know, uh, statistical mathematical uh, research with computers. Very good. And um, your talk was around the uh, Beaker uh, Notebook. That's right. Um, open source um, piece of software looked extremely interesting. Give us Thank some insight you. into that. Well, uh, you know, uh, Two Sigma has been around for about 15 years. Uh, we are a uh, tech, uh, technology company focused on investment management, and our approach is really to use science, uh, mathematics, and technology to build trading systems. And so over those 15 years, we've built uh, lots of proprietary technology, lots of research systems, and sort of used all kinds of the open source and commercial tools that are available. A couple of years ago, we decided to uh, start over and sort of build a new system from scratch that sort of brought in the best of, of everything that we knew. And that's what uh, became the Beaker Project. And it's intended primarily as a tool for, for Two Sigma's quants. It's you know, for us to uh, study the, the market and to do data science. And the company decided to open source it and to, to release it to the world for everyone to use because uh, really I think we wanted to, the best tool possible and the Two Sigma understands that open source is actually a way to, the, the best way to make the best software. That comes from a couple of places. You know, one is having a diverse user base. We get, you know, from the from the public, we get all kinds of bug reports. Right. We get all kinds of ideas, and so just the, the the software evolves faster with more users and more input. There's also a, a psychological effect that I think happens, at least for for developers like me, and that's you know, like when you're when you're writing software that only gets used by the guy down the hall. You might right. be willing to sort of cut some corners and you know do something which works for him, but isn't really the right way to do something. But when you're working on GitHub, you know, uh, in public, there's a lot of scrutiny, and just that raises the bar on you know on the quality of the code. Absolutely, the uh, pressures of uh, peer review. So um, you just mentioned it, but people want to get their hands on um, this. Uh, it's on GitHub. Yes. Okay. Uh, we have a, the website, beakernotebook.com, and that links to the uh, GitHub where you can get the source code, you can see the issue tracker. You know, the, the tool itself you know, runs on uh, Mac, PC, uh, Linux. Uh, we have a Docker container, so it's, it's really, um, we're trying to make it really accessible. Right. Uh, and just so that, so that anyone can use it. Excellent. And, um... So just in a little more detail about uh, Beaker itself, so can you talk a little bit about the uh, tech stack it's running on, what's the glue behind it, um, what languages work well with it, all that good stuff? Sure. So it's, it's fundamentally a web application, and so okay. most of it is written in, in JavaScript. And um, you know, we use the latest and greatest frameworks, which is like the Angular uh, oh, yes. MVC yeah, right. yeah. framework. And we, that includes things like the D3 visualization library, Oh, very cool. We have a really interesting sort of plug-in architecture to allow Beaker to be dynamically extended by you know individuals or institutions. So if, if your company is running Beaker, you can have a custom version of Beaker for your for your team. Oh, excellent! And the the server side is primarily Java, 
And then, uh, but the various languages that Beaker runs, so Beaker is polyglot, you can program right. and do your analysis in a variety of languages like Python, you can do R, you can do JavaScript, you know, um, you can do Java, C++, lots, lots of languages. Each, each of those languages, it has like a, a back-end server that's implemented. In okay. its, in its, you know, we use, we use the native back-end. So like when you run R in Beaker, we're using the R you already have. Right. Uh, right. If you run Python in Beaker, we're, we're talking to, you know, we're using, we're, uh, we're using the IPython, or also known as the Jupyter Python backend. Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, um, Brian Grange is going to be a speaker at our San Francisco conference as well. Cool. Yeah. Uh, we, love, we love IPython and, yeah. and Jupyter, so uh, huge, huge respect to what, what they've done. And um, so if I was to explain to someone, uh, okay, talk to them about Beaker, what would one use that for? Is it more of a data visualization tool? Is it a tool for like getting data in and finding patterns? And you know, what what do you find? There's some good use cases for it. You know, it's uh, we, we we call it research and modeling. So it it could be uh, you know you have to not only read your data in, but you have to sort of transform it. Yeah. And it's really for for that part of the process where you don't really know what you're looking for. So you can certainly do visualization. Yes. Uh, there's. Uh, almost every language has at least one visualization library, and exactly. we, we support uh, many of them. And we, we include our own native visualization right. libraries as well. So you can do cleaning, transformation, processing, analysis. It's kind Great. of a sort of a Swiss Army knife situation. Yeah, that sounds like a very powerful platform because to get all those done <laughs> and do them right, that, that must have been a ton of work. Well, uh, you know, we're, we're working really hard, um, and uh, there's still a long way to go, though. So Excellent. And, um, we have no plans on calling it, calling it done. That's good. That's good. That's great to hear, because I'm sure that's going to be um, uh, widely used by a lot of people. How does it handle, uh, do you have any um, plugins for, like, large data sets? Uh, you know, we have, uh, we, we provide access to the Spark cluster. Oh, fantastic. So, so you yeah. can do, you know, with, via PySpark and yeah. the, uh, the RSpark languages and, of course, Scala as well. So uh, I think for, for truly large data, you know, you, you need a cluster and it needs to do something that you can talk to. Like no, that's great. Well, this sounds like an uh, absolute um, awesome platform. Thank you for open source it, open source it. And, um, Thank you for stopping by the Boston Data Festival today, and I'd uh, love to have you again, Scott. It's a pleasure, Seamus. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>